Welcome to Millinery and Monsters. My name is Amy Annable and I am a Melbourne-based costumier, milliner and maker. Tonight we are going to make a fun little headpiece. Oh, the horror! And we will be making this out of a blue metallic vinyl. And whilst we are constructing this, I am going to tell you why I think that you should either watch or re-watch a 2009 horror comedy, Jennifer's Body. Now, to begin with for this design, I am going to be cutting out the vinyl using a skiable. Uh, always cut away from your body. If you chop your finger, that's on you, not on me. I will not bear that on my conscience. You were warned. Now, what I have done is I've cut down the vinyl into the size that I need. Now, I am going to make this a dual layer, but for this initial part, I'm actually only going to cut one, and then I'm going to stitch them together when the letters are cut. And this one's still a rectangle, and I'm going to then trim that one off later. I just feel like that's going to give me the best control when we get to the sewing machine. So I haven't stripped off the protective layer here, just in case I slip and I do give it a little cut where I don't want to. So that's the plan. Now the important thing to do here is press down nice and firmly so you do break through the vinyl, uh, but without putting too much pressure on. Um, I don't know if you're anything like me, but you can get a little bit too firm of a grip. And that's how you end up with RSI. Just starting by putting the vinyl piece over my printed template. And just really take your time with this. Not a race. So you want to try and get all that shape in there. So that's where you're getting the character from in your lettering. The other thing as well, if you are going too quickly or you are pressing too hard, you run the risk of slipping and then cutting off sections that you actually really did need to keep in place. So slow and steady on this one. I do actually find that pulling sort of away in one direction at a time is a little bit easier when something's a little bit thicker like this because again, if you get stuck and you yank it, you run the risk of either scratching the vinyl or just ripping it and then it's, you have to start again. Now something with this lettering, it's actually vital that you do not slip through and cut the connection pieces because that is keeping the whole thing together. So really think about where you're cutting before you start cutting. All right, some spoilers, but you've had 12 years. Our film takes place in a small American town by the name of Devil's Kettle, which is built around a waterfall with no determinable depth. No matter what is thrown into the water, it is seemingly gone forever, even secrets. Within this town lives Jennifer, a striking and overtly confident cheerleader, played by Megan Fox, and her reserved, devoted best friend, and our narrator, Needy, played by Amanda Seyfried. It is clear to the audience immediately that whilst there is a deep love and adoration within the friendship explored later in the film, we are also shown the toxicity of a strong power imbalance with Jennifer always demanding the spotlight. Needy shadows herself at Jennifer's behest and her needs are always second. Needy changes her plans, alters her outfits and even forces interests all to appease her friend who has learnt to use her confidence and sexuality to manipulate all those around her. Her body is a tool her weapon, and her entire sense of self. Needy must never outshine her. After coercing Needy into attending a gig at a local bar, the girls converse with big city band, Low Shoulder, fronted by Nikolai, played by Adam Brody. Jennifer flirts with Nikolai before offering to buy him a round of drinks. Upon her departure, Needy overhears the band discussing whether or not Jennifer is a virgin, with Nikolai stating, he knows girls like that, and they're all talk and never put out. Outraged by their goal, Needy scolds the band for their deplorable behaviour and states that Jennifer is a virgin, which we, the audience, know to be a lie, and tells them that she's too good for them all anyway. As the band plays, a fire breaks out within the bar and quickly consumes the building, with many patrons perishing in the flames. Upon making their escape, the girls find themselves in front of Nikolai, whom offers them a ride in his van. Despite Needy's pleas, Jennifer goes with the band and Needy makes her way home, distressed and voicing concerns on the phone to her boyfriend, Chip. Jennifer appears in Needy's kitchen without explanation, bloodied and muddied before ravaging the contents of the fridge and proceeding to vomit a violent puddle of bile. 
We cut to the next day where Jennifer is inexplicably glowing, utterly invigorated, while the rest of the school mourns the loss of fellow classmates to the fire. Jennifer later spots a classmate, a football player whose best friend was lost to the flames. Using her body to tempt him into the woods, she toys with him like an animal playing with their food, as she reveals herself to be a cannibalistic succubus, devouring him in a gruesome demonic display. With another life lost, the town is in turmoil. As time passes, Band low shoulder are growing in fame and fortune, and with the passing days, Jennifer's looks, and in turn her demeanour, fade. Drab and drawn, Jennifer looks to restore herself, and who better to prey upon than those Needy holds dearest? A friend of Needy's must simply want Jennifer more, and if they don't, she will make them. She will not be outshined by Needy. She takes pleasure in taking from her, and so Colin is the next on Jennifer's hit list. Seducing him and devouring him, she replenishes herself once more. We are shown Jennifer's invincibility with self-inflicted wounds such as burning of the tongue and cutting of the flesh healing instantly. Jennifer reveals to Needy the sordid tale of what happened to her the night of the fire and how the band sacrificed her body in a dark ritual to attain fame and fortune, throwing the knife into the falls and leaving Jennifer discarded with no regard for her at all. They used her body for their own needs and spared no concern for the person within. Recanting the story, Jennifer embraces Needy in an incredibly intimate kiss, where we, the audience, can feel the passion and confusion felt by Needy, a build-up of long-felt, unexplored emotions reaching their height. Needy banishes Jennifer from the room, scorning she who is not accustomed to being told no. Needy discovers that should an impure sacrifice be made, whilst the band will get what they desire, the patron demon will take the host body for their own, feeding on the likes of whom have wounded her. Only a blade to the heart can move it on. In a final act of taking from Needy, Jennifer kills another boy, this time in the form of Chip, Needy's boyfriend. And with that final act of selfishness, Needy removes her love from Jennifer, taking away all of the power she holds over her. And with one final blow, she strikes her both physically and metaphorically in the heart. Even in her dying whisper, Jennifer recognizes herself only as her body and says, My tit! To which Needy replies, No, your heart. A reminder to both Jennifer and we, the audience, that Jennifer was more than just a good looking body. Now that we have got the pieces stitched together, I'm going to go on ahead and cut off the excess of the secondary layer. Once you cut Barbie's hair, it doesn't grow back, so be careful. Now that you could carefully do this with scissors if you are a little concerned, I personally don't want to. Uh, we'll find out if that comes back to bite me or not. <laughs> Now that we have the pieces stitched together and everything is all cut out, we are now ready to attach this to our headband. So similar to last time, we will be using a thin wire headband and we will be using a thick millinery wire straightened out and attaching that three spokes this time using a thin millinery wire, just binding that to the headband. And then we will be taking our tulle this time in white, to cut out strips and then stretch out giving us this effect and then we'll be binding the wire and the headband in this and then we will then separately attach this to the wire spokes. Jennifer's Body was written by Diablo Cody off the back of her Oscar win for the screenplay of Juno. Always wanting to write a horror film, her project was greenlit and a cast and crew chosen with Karen Kusama taking the reins as director. Sadly, due to a complete mismanagement of the marketing team, this film was a box office flop, ridiculed by all, misunderstood to its core. With undertones of Heathers and Mean Girls, Jennifer's Body is a commentary on the intricacies of the relationships between young women and how immaturity and insecurities, coupled with toxic power imbalances, can take form in ego, ownership and jealousy. The film is quirky, quippy and fun, with many a meme being born. There are certainly lines of dialogue which are problematic and fashion choices that assault the eyes, soundly landing this film in the time of which it was created, but the messages of female empowerment and the holding of abusers accountable sit far better with the audience of our current social climate. 
a resurgence in views has pushed this film from joke to cult classic a decade after its release. The film pokes fun at the male gaze, alluding to Jennifer's body being bared for us to see before cutting away to a modest camera angle or a close-up of her face, showing us that despite our expectations or how suggestive Jennifer's behaviour may be, we are not owed her body. Whilst the film showcases positivity towards owning one's own sexuality, it reminds us frequently not to confuse this with self-worth. Looks will fade, but friendship and self-love must be revered. No matter how beautiful you may be skin deep and how confidently you present yourself, everyone has insecurities, which we must learn to manage rather than push others down to make ourselves feel big. A wonderful message, really. So where did they go so wrong? At the time of its release, the media was at its peak of tearing down Megan Fox following her departure from the Transformers franchise. People either hated her because of her looks or loved her only for her looks. She was reduced to nothing more than an object. Sound familiar? No consideration was taken as per her acting prowess, and her only value seen by the marketing department was her sex appeal. Their entire strategy was to market the fact that Megan Fox hot. Their words. So much so that the initial trailer did not even feature Amanda Seyfried. You know, the narrator. Amending this by using their kiss in a cheapened, shallow attention grab, removing the weight of the moment completely. Test audiences were comprised of men outraged by the film's lack of, and I quote, B-E-W-B-S, and Juno fans not expecting a horror film. Basically, a room full of people the movie wasn't made for. Audiences entered the theatre with no concept of what the film was to be, and much to everyone's surprise, we were given a clever horror comedy with strong female characters overpowering both emotional and literal demons, using boys as pawns along the way. Not quite the mindless cinematic perv most expected. I personally remember leaving the cinema confused, unsure if I had enjoyed the film as it hadn't been advertised to me, so why did it resonate so closely to me? It was years and a rewatch later when I realised that it had been for me and people like me all along. Whilst I am glad it is speaking to those with clearer eyes to see it now, I can't help but wonder if, like Jennifer, Megan Fox had not been whittled down to the worth of her body, but her talent, and the talent of those who made this killer film, would it have ever flopped at all? Oh, the horror! This is our headpiece in all of its glory. Hopefully this has inspired you to go and make some magic of your own. I can't recommend enough that you go re-watch or watch for the first time Jennifer's body through the lens in which it was meant to be viewed from. But until next time, happy haunting and I'll see you soon with this spooky little story. Bye! Thank you for joining me for tonight's tale of guts and glitter. Don't forget to like and subscribe.